again. Uh, please um, be noticed, I, I would like to apology uh, in, on behalf uh, of Minister of Industry and Trade uh, that he couldn't come uh, at the end. But I hope you enjoyed your lunch, your meal, and I'm not afraid to say that here comes the perfect dessert. <laughs> because our next guest uh, is one of the most experienced uh, professionals in the field of uh, cultural and creative industry, a true expert and uh, founder of Creative England. And his presentation as answers the crucial question, why is the creative economy important? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Newbegin, <laughs> welcome. Okay, so I've never been introduced as the dessert before. Uh, does that mean I should have a cherry on my head? But then I think, no, the cherries were the symbol for the Communist Party in the, in the 2019 election, so in the 1990 election, so maybe not. Uh, it's a fantastic privilege to come to Prague because it's such a beautiful city. And uh, I, I had forgotten that it's also the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. And... Um, I visited the National Museum, and there's this one, I'm sure many of you have, there's this wonderful display of posters from the 1990 election. And it made me think uh, how important artists and humorists were in creating the environment in which the first democratic elections took place. And I'd also, I didn't know that, uh, that the Civic Forum, one of the foundations of the Civic Forum was the, was the Prague Drama Club, of which Václav Havel was a member. And I thought uh, we consistently underestimate how important the arts and culture is in any society. And uh, it made me think of Bertolt Brecht's great uh, line that we think of art as a reflection of reality, but art is a hammer with which we shape reality. And I think we underestimate easily how important arts and culture is and how important arts and culture is in shaping the economy. So this morning we've been talking about the creative industries and the many different definitions that there are of the creative industries. I thought it would be useful to try and put that in a slightly bigger, broader context because we also use this phrase of the creative economy. And what do we mean by the creative economy? So if uh, I can make this work. Um, this picture, uh, I can't believe that those horses could actually pull that weight. But um, in my, my brief economic history of the world, basically, until 200 years ago, anything that you wanted to do depended on people and horses. That was the maximum power, the maximum motive power that any society could mobilize apart from wind. So this is what the world, this is the most advanced form of transport in the world's economy until 200 years ago. And then, oh my God, going the wrong direction. Uh, 200 years ago, 150 years ago, people began to explore the power of coal and oil to generate steam and electricity. And with steam and electricity, we have totally transformed the world in the last 200 years. And now we're on the brink of a different kind of uh, motive power for everything, and that is creativity. And in the same way, it's become a joke that if oil was the fuel that drove the global economy in the 20th century, creativity is the fuel that will drive the economy in the 21st century. But what, what's the context that we've created for this new economy? And why do we need to think about the importance of creativity and the challenges that we need to face by being creative in the future? And the first is this urbanization. The beginning of the, of the, the, the 20th century, something like 5% of the world's population lived in cities. Now it's 60% and it's growing. There are at least six cities in the world, cities that have populations twice as great as this country. Over 20 million people, Shanghai, 
uh, Delhi, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, there's a whole string of them. They are creating opportunities for people, but they're also creating problems on a gigantic scale about energy use, about waste use, about air quality, about quality of life. And thinking about how we plan our cities in the future is going to call on ever greater creativity. And any doubt, you just look behind you there, there's a, a beginnings of a master plan for part of this city. We have to think much more carefully about how we plan our cities. And as a tourist coming to Prague, one of the things that I feel is, if you live in Prague, you must hate tourists. I mean, it is just ridiculous how many people there are in the middle of the city. And the tourism is becoming a major global problem because as more people get wealthier, more people want to travel. Of course they do, we all want to travel, but it creates problems. And there are cities like Venice, Dubrovnik, Barcelona, where the cities are being destroyed by tourism. The very thing that people come to see is destroying the thing that they've come to see. And so we have to think creatively about how we deal with this huge problem of urbanization, which we've never had to deal with before in human history. Secondly, is globalization. I found this fantastic picture of McDonald's in China. I mean, McDonald's is everywhere in China. And we are used to living in a global economy. And we are, I don't need to tell any of you that there is also a huge resistance to the idea of globalization. Uh, in this country, in many countries in Europe, certainly in the UK, one of the things that's happening now is people want to turn their back on globalization and say, no, we're going to be, we're going to protect our traditional cultural heritage. We can't do that because we do live in a global society, in a global economy, but I don't think that means that we have to lose our cultural identity. To be part of a global society and to be proud and distinctive in our own cultures is not a paradox, it's not a contradiction. And one of the ways that we can resolve that is thinking through how the creative economy works. So another issue is digitization. Something like two-thirds of all the people in the world are now estimated to have access to a mobile phone. It may not be a very good smartphone, but there are something like six, between six and seven billion mobile phones in use around the world. And what that means is that everybody is connected to what's going on around the world. And every kid has the opportunity to participate culturally, educationally, economically, in what's happening around the world. And the, the um, chief executive of British Telecom in the UK used to make a joke that um, it's very easy to start a business in the creative industry. All you need is a smartphone and a smart kid. This is not the way industries have worked in the past. Industries have been capital intensive. This is a completely different kind of economy in which all kinds of people can participate. And the creative industries are growing all around the world and they're growing fastest in Africa and Latin America. And there are millions of kids who are very smart and very talented and they're beginning to think how they build businesses and they're creating a different kind of economy which is going to be important for all of us. And then another change is automation. Uh, and we heard this morning about, Gail was talking about how uh, the creative industries are relatively immune to the impact of robotization and automation because they are by definition dependent on social skills, emotional intelligence, all the things which our robots have not yet developed. Maybe they will in 50 years time, but they haven't. But what's happening is there are massive changes in the global economy. And I think we're underestimating how fast these are coming. I chose this picture because I know the car industry is the biggest single industry in the Czech Republic. 120,000 people working directly, maybe half a million altogether. It's a huge part of your economy. But this is a car factory, not one single human being. And what is happening in all these manufacturing industries is productivity is increasing, productive output is increasing, but it's dependent on technology, not dependent on people. And already there is massive overcapacity in the car industry around the world. There are not going to be jobs in the car industry 
in anything like the scale they are at the moment in another 20 years time. Any manufacturer that's doing that will go out of business. So in a fundamental ways, our economy is changing and it's not just manufacturing, it's happening in services and retail. And if you'd said, I know, 100 years ago that agriculture would now employ 2% of people in Czech Republic, people would say, you're crazy, agriculture is important. 2% of the workforce in this country work in agriculture. The same is beginning to happen in manufacturing. And we have to think about, basically, what's going to happen to kids. Whoops, I've completely killed it. So one of the consequences, one of the unintended consequences of that change is unemployment. This is a picture uh, in Tunisia. Uh, and I chose this picture because across North Africa, graduate unemployment is running at 30%. So kids with university degrees are not able to find work. It's not impacting on our societies yet, but it probably will. And the fact of the matter is the global economy is changing and people want jobs and they want jobs that are satisfying. And if we are not thinking about how people are going to find employment, that uh, enables them to pay the bills, but also to have a fulfilled life, then we're going to be in trouble. So this is another huge change that's taking place in our society. And then here's another change. This is the cover of a magazine called The Economist. Some of you may know it. It's a big uh, leading economic journal uh, in the US and, and in the UK. Uh, the $650 billion binge, and a, a binge, if you're not familiar, and even the interpreter may not know this word, the binge is a kind of drunken orgy of food. So it's saying 650 billion, what's it on? This is on content creation. The Economist estimates that in the last five years, the amount of money invested around the world in film, television, video games, theater is $650 billion. Uh, and they make the comment that that is the same amount of money has been invested in the last five years in the oil and gas industry around the world. So if you said, which is more important, the oil industry or the movie business, you say, hey, it's the oil business. But actually, now, the way our economy is changing, it is content, which is one of the biggest growth areas in the world economy. We haven't really kind of thought about that and come to terms with it. So that's another big change. And then finally, of course, the biggest change of all, is that we're destroying the planet. Uh, this is from Brazil, of course. Uh, and again, you know, the impact is not so immediate here, but it is already beginning to happen. And if we don't think creatively about how we deal with climate change, then we're in trouble. And if we don't do anything about climate change, we're going to have to be even more creative because the problems that we inherit in 20 years' time will be even greater than the problems than we inherit today. So, um, so I feel this has been very pessimistic so far. I'm going to try and make it a little bit lighter from now on. Uh, but these are changes that are going on in the world now. And one of the reasons why I think we have to think about a creative economy and the creative industries as a key driver in that economy is because we face these challenges. And I want to talk a little bit about what's the relationship between creative industries and this new economy. So this guy, Robert Hewison, he's a cultural critic in the UK. Uh, it, the configuration of relationships that gives a system its essential characteristics. Thus, it is less helpful to define the creative economy by what it does then try to understand how it's organized. And we heard this morning, some people have, like to have gastronomy in their definition, some people have software in their definition, blah, blah, blah. What are the characteristics that help us to identify what is part of the creative economy and what is not? So one of the things we've also been hearing about this morning is intellectual property. Uh, and I think a simple way of expressing that is to say, Ideas are now more valuable than products. This is a guy called Jonathan Ive. He's a designer, an arts graduate, graduate from the Royal College of Art in London. He designed the iPhone. The iPhone is manufactured in China by Foxon in Shenzhen. They employ 100,000 people making iPhones. Foxon retains about 6% of the value of every iPhone that they build. Apple 
that this guy works for retains 60%. They retain 60% because it's their idea, not because they make the phone. So this one man, who's an arts graduate, has probably been responsible more than anybody else for creating the most valuable company on the planet at the moment. And it's his idea. He's not making anything at all. So ideas are worth more than products. And for any government, that is a huge challenge. For any investor, that is a huge challenge. And banks like to lend money against property. They like to build buildings. They like to buy machines. They like whatever. But to buy ideas is very risky. And we have to think about how we create the fiscal incentives, the tax policies, and the culture that enables us to invest more readily in ideas. One of the few economies that seems to me has really understood that is the United States. And one of the reasons that they are very successful in the platform business and the digital world is because more people are prepared to invest in ideas in the US than they are in most other countries. And again, Gail and Erin, their, their presentation this morning highlighted that, that even at a very low level, it's difficult for people who are in the ideas business to raise the money they need. So I have four pictures here that run together. This is a, a traditional classroom. People sitting on their own, being bored, and probably not learning anything very much. And they're getting ready to work in a place like that. People working on their own, not doing anything very much, and being very bored. That is still our traditional model for education, preparing people for this industrial society. But actually, this is what many modern workplaces look like. Of course, it's not a typical modern workplace, but it is, it's one of the kind of symbols of change that's going on in our economy. It's people working together. They're not working in isolation from each other, they're working together. In fact, they may not be, they may be booking their holidays. They may be watching a pornographic movie. You have no idea what they're doing, but they're doing it together and they're learning from each other and they're exchanging ideas. And so this is a classroom in Singapore. And this, is, this matches that way of working. It's people working together, solving problems together. And the, um, a guy called Andy Haldane, who's the chief economist in the Bank of England, he says, you know, knowledge, Knowledge is useful for school exams and TV quizzes, but we don't really need it for anything else because we have Google. He said, what we need is imagination, and our education system is not encouraging imagination. It's only encouraging knowledge. And we have to be thinking about an education system that enables young people, and all of us, to learn how to learn together, to exchange ideas together, to swap ideas creatively. So another of the characteristics of this new economy is we have to really rethink education and what is the purpose of education, what's the way we deliver education. And this is a um, quote from you know, Cisco, a big American uh, platform uh, uh, media company, tech company. They employ 50,000 people around the world. They say, I don't believe it, but they say this is what they encourage their staff to do. Better to ask forgiveness than ask permission. In other words, if you have an idea, do it. And if it's a bad idea, then you apologize to the boss. I said, how many people have lost their jobs because they believed you? Okay, I mean, I, it's, but still, that's their ambition, is to say it is better to take a risk. Again, our education system, you know, if you... You couldn't run a school on that basis, could you? And perhaps you shouldn't run a school on that basis because you're dealing with kids, but it's a radically different way of thinking about how we approach work. And this sort of goes with it. This man was the vice chancellor of London University. I mean, this is a phrase which people use all around the world now. We're educating students for jobs that have not yet been invented. So what he, what he meant by that is we have to be teaching young people how to keep on learning and how to be flexible and how to go on changing their ideas and how to go on learning from each other because there is no point in teaching them one particular kind of knowledge. It's not that one particular kind of knowledge isn't valuable, but if we don't understand how to build and share and change and adapt, then we will not succeed in this new economy. And then here's another change, which relates to what I was, the picture of the car factory. We also talked this morning about mapping and data. 
And one of the one of the benefits of the first mapping, well, put it another way, when we did the first mapping in the UK in 1998, our finance department was really not very interested. When we repeated that mapping on the same basis two years later, we could then say this sector is generating jobs twice as fast as the rest of the economy. Then the finance department got interested. And the incredible thing is, the sector has gone on generating jobs at twice the rate of the rest of the UK economy almost every year for the last 20 years. So this is a different kind of economy with different kinds of drivers. So these are some of the characteristics of a new economy. And they're characteristics that are difficult for government to understand and difficult for investors to understand and difficult for all of us in a way because we're still locked into the old paradigms but they're characteristics that we need to think about and need to find ways of embracing and this is a little picture from the London Underground um, a poster campaign after the Brexit referendum uh, London everyone welcome London is open the reason uh, I do some work with the mayor of London in London, the creative industries now account for 15% of the city's economy. That's one, one job in six of the people, 15% of the, of the labor market. They're worth about 50 billion pounds, which is, I don't know, $65 billion, a lot of money. It's as important as the financial services sector. And also, it's important because it's become important because it's got such a great critical mass. It's drawing people in from all around the world. And one of the many catastrophes that Brexit will unleash, assuming it happens, unfortunately, is that the London creative economy is dependent on people from all around the world, from all around the European Union and all around the world. 35% of London's population now comes from elsewhere in the world. I was born elsewhere in the world. That enriches our economy and it enriches our society. But my point is that for the, the economic planning in London now, creative industries has to be at the core of it. And it's not just a bunch of software engineers in their t-shirts. The financial services sector, which is the other part of the London economy, is also dependent on the cultural life of the country. Why? Because when we do serious research, one of the reasons why international corporations say they want to move to London is because their senior executives like living in London because there's a fantastic arts and cultural scene in London. So the success of our financial services is partly dependent on the cultural life of the country. And we forget these things. We think, well, it's like two different departments. The economy is here, there's culture there. I think it's brilliant that here, your Ministry of Trade and Industry and the Ministry of Culture have signed this joint agreement, a country for the future, that's very important. Thinking about how government departments work together to tackle these problems is important. And without, without going on about it, in, in, uh, in London, we have an economic partnership board which has got some oversight for the uh, economic planning for the city and a cultural strategy board. And now increasingly what we're doing is we're having joint meetings because you cannot separate the cultural success of the city from the economic success of the city. And we have to be thinking in these terms in the future. And then I come back to uh, Apple. Again, Jonathan Ive designed the iPhone. Steve Jobs, as I'm sure you know, is the man who invented Apple, set it up. And when he was asked uh, what was the success of Apple due to Two things. One was this, it's at the intersection of technology and the liberal arts. Okay, this was in an interview. The next question was, what do you mean by that? And he said, what I mean by that is, we don't employ computer geeks, we employ artists, musicians and poets who are passionate about technology. <laughs> He's built the most successful company in the world by employing poets, artists and musicians who are interested in technology. So. I think we consistently underestimate how important culture and creativity is in our economy. And a couple of little examples from around the world. This is a little booklet produced in Indonesia. Um, a guy who was the, the mayor of Bandung, which is the second city in West Java, um, set up a 
an, an organization called Bandung Creative City, and he stood to be the mayor, and he beat all the political candidates and became the mayor of Bandung. Now he is the governor of West Java, which is the third most important political position in Indonesia. And he says, in five years' time, I will be the president of Indonesia. And he may be. But this booklet, on the basis of what he did in this one city, Bandung, he and his colleagues have now created a network of 200 creative cities, what they call creative cities, all across Indonesia. And the, in this little booklet, uh, there are 10 principles for a creative city. The first one is, it must be a compassionate city. The second one is, it must be an open and inclusive city with a trustworthy government. The third thing, it must celebrate the creativity of all its citizens. The fourth thing is, it should celebrate its cultural heritage in order to build for the future. The fifth thing is, it should be uh, very consistent in using low energy and so on. So it's a mixture of social, cultural and economic objectives. It's not just about the economy of the cities, it is about the whole city as it is experienced by the people living in it. I thought, well, that is well ahead of any thinking going on in Europe. Uh, so this guy, now I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's from Singapore, he said, oh, I'm in Bangkok with, with this guy, and he, now he's trying to persuade uh, Thailand to have creative cities. So he's now, he's made it, he's, Every city in Indonesia is becoming creative. Now he's moving on to Thailand. This change is happening in many parts of the world. And here's another little booklet. This one is written by the president of Colombia, who was an executive in the Inter-American Development Bank. And really, it's about the creative economy in Colombia. But he said, nobody knows what the creative economy is. And even people who do argue about whether it includes gastronomy or software or blah, blah, blah. So we said, we're not going to call it the creative economy. We'll call it the orange economy. Why? Because orange is the color of happiness. So it's the happy economy. This is not some crazy academic. This is the president of the country who's written this book. Uh, and it is, it's, uh, uh, contains ideas about how to build an economy in Colombia which celebrates the creative cultural heritage of the country and also deals with the fact that automation and the fourth industrial revolution will not generate the kind of traditional high technology jobs that they have usually been dependent on for their economic growth. So to Latin America, East Asia, other parts of the world where people are thinking about how, how what is the relationship between culture and the economy in a, in a very radical way. And then finally, this is um, in Hong Kong, it's in Kowloon. All this area at the front is reclaimed land uh, and it's called the, the West Kowloon Cultural Center. The Hong Kong government is investing three billion US dollars in building a huge cultural center. Why? Because if Hong Kong, they want Hong Kong to remain a world city in competition with Singapore, Shanghai, so on. And they realize that if they're going to do that, it has to also have a strong cultural life. You can't just have economic growth. So they're investing all this money to build a, a cultural center to make sure that the cultural offer of Hong Kong is as powerful as the economic offer. That's how they see their future developing. And uh, I think if we're not thinking about how we deal with these challenges and think about how we're redeveloping our economy in a way that is not dependent on high energy use, high development of products, high use of the world's resources. And we're thinking instead about an economy which is labor intensive, which the creative industries are, which is relatively low in its use of energy, which the creative industries are, which is not so heavily dependent on products, but is also dependent on experiences, if we don't do these things, we will wind up like this polar bear in a planet which really isn't worth living in. So being creative is pretty important. And then finally, just the last few minutes, oh, it's very easy to say these things. It gives big problems for all governments, at local level, at regional level, and at national level. 
This is a um, statement from one of the United Nations reports in 2008, written by a, an economist from Brazil. And I'll just read it out. The interface between creativity, culture, economics, and technology, as expressed in the ability to create and circulate intellectual capital, has the potential to generate income, job, and export earnings, while at the same time promoting social inclusion, cultural diversity, and human development. This is what the emerging creative economy has begun to do. That is a beautiful statement, but if you are working in government, it would make you want to commit suicide. How the hell do you get all these different elements stitched together? We have an economics department, we have a finance department, we have an education department, we have a culture department. It's talking about all of them. This is a huge challenge to how we organize things in the future. And one of the things that strikes me about the creative industries and creative economy is it is much easier to make things happen at city level, municipal level, than at national level, because at city level, you can get everybody round a table. Again, Gail and Erin were talking about this. One of the things that we've done in Creative England is to get everybody in a city, the mayor, maybe vice chancellor from the university, some local business people, some people from the arts, around to talk about things to be done collectively. It's easier to do that at a city level than at a national level. But our government structures are still geared to a 20th century model of an industrial society where these things are all separated and we're beginning to move into a time where you can't disentangle cultural, social and economic forces. And the fact that um, we were talking about this at lunchtime, in Iceland, the government is saying we are going to abandon GDP as the measure of economic success and look at other ways of measuring what the government is achieving for the people of Iceland. What's their well-being, what's their sense of cultural identity, as well as their sense of economic power. This is, a, this is an area in which creative industries and the creative economy have a crucial role to play. And so, finally, again, you'll be, we'll be doing some promotion for Creative England here, but two little examples of, uh, I think, really interesting cross-sectoral thinking which again typifies this new economy. We uh, w launched an investment fund at Creative England, which was really for people in the video games world working, developing products for our health services on the basis that sometimes people from those kind of creative backgrounds could come up with better solutions than clinicians. And the, the design council in the UK has similarly done that, the designers rethinking the way hospitals work not because they have medical skills, but because they have design skills. So using disciplines which in the past we tended to separate. Here's an, another company that Creative England invested in, basically a video business, which uh, re reinvented the way evidence could be presented in the court, in the criminal courts, and has been hugely successful and is now being exported around the world, and it's a very, very powerful business. Somebody basically from the games business now working in the justice business, because these things need to be seen as being able to work cross-sectorally. And then, I'm sorry, this is another long quote, but I think it's a very interesting one, uh, and goes back to what I was saying about the fourth industrial revolution, and again, I'll just read it. Any task that can be measured by the metrics of productivity, in other words, output per hour, is a task we want automation to do. Productivity is for robots. What humans excel at is wasting time, playing, experimenting, creating, exploring. None of these activities fare well under the scrutiny of productivity. That's why science and art are so difficult to fund, but they're also the foundations of long-term growth. This is one of our leading economists has written this. So, uh, again, a problem for government. You say, well, what we're good at is wasting time. What, I mean, we, we need to be thinking through how we allow our creativity to develop in much more radical ways than we have done in the past. I think that is a very important observation, particularly the last bit, which is these are the foundations of long-term growth. I think, you know, Archimedes, sitting in his bath, suddenly 
discovered how you could measure metric volume. I mean, anyway, people waste time, and great ideas happen when people are wasting time. And I've lost the thing again. Um, and this is I'm nearly at the end now, but this is another, I think, very interesting observation. In 2005, uh, the UK government commissioned a review of innovation in the economy by a man, Sir George Cox. And uh, one of the things he said was, we should use the massive power of public procurement to encourage more innovative solutions from suppliers. When we talk about government support for the creative industries, very often we're thinking about subsidies or loans. He's saying the government is buying goods and services all the time. Why not use creative people? One of the things that he suggested in his report was that any business supplying services to the government must have at least two artists on its board. Fantastic. Of course, the government chucked it in the waste bin immediately, but nevertheless, what a powerful idea. And some governments have listened to that. I don't know if you're familiar in Estonia, uh, after, the, after the collapse of the Soviet empire, they decided they hated the Soviet bureaucracy so much they would, have, they would not have any government uh, functions based on paper. And they, they created this concept of e-Estonia. And they asked small software, tiny software companies in Estonia to develop services that would enable them to run the government entirely on an e-platform basis because it would be cheaper and it would be different uh, and it would be innovative. And one of the consequences of that is that Estonia, a tiny country, now has one of the most sophisticated uh, IT sectors anywhere in the world and they're bidding internationally for international contracts. That comes purely out of a decision that the government made not to give subsidies, but to give jobs to people who they thought were creative to help them reinvent the way government worked for the benefit of people. That's a great example of how things can change. And then final two slides here. Uh, again, the, you saw with the Creative England presentation this morning, talent is everywhere. Just want to say talent is everywhere. It is this, the creative economy, the creative industries are growing in every region of the world. United Nations do a regular report. They say one of the astonishing things is every region of the world is now experiencing growth. And one of the strongest areas of growth is what they call South-South trade. It's Asia, Africa, Latin America. It's happening all around the world. And economies that are thinking about how to engage in this will undoubtedly be the economies that are more successful in the future. And then finally, again, I'm copying from my colleagues in Creative England this morning, but we connect talent with money, markets, and networks. And I think when we think about, at a practical level, how to develop creative industries, we nearly always think about money. That what's the government, what's the government doing to support the creative sector? But actually, it's markets. Who, who would have thought that somebody in the video games business could make a profit from supplying goods to the health service? Who would have thought that uh, IT uh, geeks in Estonia could really change the way their government worked? Thinking about how we use the skills of this sector in new markets and wider markets is as important as money. And then finally, networks. Undoubtedly, Networks are the crucial way that we're all learning from each other. And I think one of the things I think is great about the Creatino project is that you've drawn in people from the UK, from Spain, from Austria, and so on. You've made it, it's been a real international network of people learning from each other because nobody has got the uh, solutions to these problems. They're problems that we're all wrestling with. Uh, we're all coming up with our own solutions and we need to share them the people in Indonesia, the people in Colombia, the people in Estonia, the people here in the Czech Republic, people in the UK. It's by networking these ideas that we come up with the most effective solutions. And because my colleagues didn't put up uh, the advert of how you can find the Creative England web address, I thought I would, so thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Newbegin, thank you so much. It was very inspirational, and I think it might make us or encourage us to think even 
far, so thank you so much for joining and sharing with us. A teď zpátky k češtině a do České republiky, do českých vod, mohla bych poeticky říci i do českých luhů a hájů, protože je to právě ta nabídka nespočtu dechberoucích lokací, která je pro zahraniční produkce velice atraktivní. Česká republika kromě toho disponuje taky vybavenými studii a zkušenými profesionály a ke konkurence schopnosti českého filmového průmyslu a kinematografie nejenom v evropském, ale i světovém měřítku mají přispět také filmové pobídky. Ty můžou využít jak ať už tuzemské nebo zahraniční produkce natáčené v České republice. A zajímavým přesahem tohohle mechanismu je třeba i pozitivní dopad na českou startupovou scénu. Možná byste to nečekali, uvedu konkrétní příklad. Možná znáte seriál Carnival Row, jeho hlavní hvězda je Orlando Bloom. Ten seriál se natáčel a natáčí v Praze a právě během natáčení ve volné chvíli se Orlando Brum v okolí Prahy prohání na kole. Za jehož vývojem je český startup, je to značka Festka. A program filmových pobídek je zpravován státním fondem kinematografie a my máme teď tu čest přivítat jeho ředitelku, dámy a pánové, tedy ředitelka státního fondu kinematografie Helena Bezděk Fraňková. Vítejte. Dobrý den, já si neumím klikat. Jo. Tak dobrý den, já bych napřed udělala takovou kontrolní akci a chtěla bych vědět, kdo tady z vás je kreativec, ten, co opravdu něco kreativně dělá. Můžete zvednout ruku? Super, tak k vám budu hovořit. <laughs> ten zbytek, vy jste státní úředníci? <laughs> dobrý, tak obslužný personál vezmeme třeba. Já bych navázala na to, co jsme tady před chvilkou slyšeli. Dost často se tam změňovalo slovo government. A já si myslím, že v, české, v českých luzích a hájích máme právě tenhle problém, že vlastně vy kreativci víte už, o co kráčí v kreativních průmyslech a je na vás, abyste to vysvětlili tomu governmentu. A já jsem něco podobného s filmovým průmyslem prožívala v roce 2006, já jsem původně asistent režie, který omylem vystudoval práva. A já jsem nastoupila na ministerstvo kultury v roce 2006. Řekla jsem slovo filmový průmysl a bylo mi řečeno, že to je zprosté slovo. V té době nikdo nevěděl, že může existovat něco jako kreativní průmysl. Nicméně proto jsem si připlavila prezentaci, která by vám měla pomoct vysvětlit, co to jsou kreativní průmysly v českých luzích a hájích. Moje prezentace se jmenuje Spirála narrativu v kontextu dopadu na veřejné rozpočty. Vy, co jste kreativní, tak asi víte, co to znamená. Nicméně, základem celé té debaty je o tom, že máme různé kmeny. A vy máte jeden jazyk a ten government má jiný jazyk. A musíte se naučit spolu hovořit. Já na ministerstvo kultury jsem to provozovala v roce 2006, 7 a 8, než jsme si porozuměli. Byla jsem v roli transformátora. Vysvětlovala jsem, co to je plac, natáčení, výroba, development, distribuce a tak dále. A na druhou stranu mi odpovídali rozpočtová pravidla, dopady do veřejných rozpočtů, to jsou jiné dopady, než jsou do státního rozpočtu a tak dále. Nicméně základem je, že kreativita je v každém z nás. Úplně od malička. My holky jsme chtěli být princezny, kluci chtěli být asi rytíři. Jenom u někoho se ta kreativita spojí s talentem, takže na začátku děláme tohle, potom jenom někdo dokáže pak vyrobit ten druhý obrázek. Pak jsou lidi, kteří by strašně chtěli být kreativní, ale nemají na to. 
takže se stanou aspoň součástí kreativního, kreativního týmu někoho jiného, což jsem byla právě já. Takže jsem nastoupila jako asistent režie na několik filmů, takže jsem tadyhle jsem s Frodo Pitlíkem, to byl film Everything is Illuminated, to druhý je film Hartová válka, kde teda hlavní hvězdou byl Bruce Willis, ale Colin Faller je prostě jako lepší, že jo? <laughs> no, a tady už je kus mého života. Když se podíváte, tak v roce 2002, 2003, byla Česká republika, co se týká výroby jakéhokoliv audiovizuálního produktu, tak nějak v úrovni nad 5 miliardama objemu ročně. Pak se v Maďarsku zavedly filmové pobídky a my jsme udělali velmi rychlej se šup dolů. Jako opravdu velmi rychlej. To bylo z roku na rok. V té době já jsem stála na place, čekala jsem, až si byl Pullman oblíkne tričko a odvedu ho na plac. A tam, jak jsem čekala, mi bylo zjištěno další filmy nám odjeli do Maďarska, Heleno, co budeme dělat? Mně došlo, že nebudu mít na chleba, takže jsem se v roce 2004, 5, 6, tak nějak jako potácela a pak jsem řekla, dobře, vystudovala jsem práva, odcházím na ministerstvo kultury zkusit vydělat, udělat ten samý zákon, jako mají v Maďarsku. V roce 2006, 7, 8, 9 jsem prožívala tu transformaci z někoho, kdo je na place, na někoho, kdo je v kanceláři a snaží se nějakým způsobem vysvětlit, co to je kreativní odvětví, jak se natáčejí filmy, proč je důležitý, že se ty filmy natáčejí, kolik to znamená peněz. Odpovědí mi bylo, no tak ty filmaři prostě nebudou točit, no tak budou dělat něco jiného. Furt mi nedocházelo, jak je možný, že ten stát si neovědomuje to, že prostě přijde americká zakázka nebo jakákoliv jiná zakázka, že tady utratí spoustu peněz a zaměstná v lukrativních profesích, kreativních profesích s přidanou hodnotou spoustu lidí. A to nejenom filmaře. Když vezmete stát jako rozpočet výroby filmu, tak 40% jsou filmařské profese, 60%. Jsou jakékoliv profese, které nemají s filmem nic společného, ale jsou kreativní. Například normální truhlář, který standardně vyrábí židle nebo poličky nebo já nevím, skřínky, tak najednou dostane zakázku vyrobit šest gotických lavic do dekorace. Nebo kolik máme vlastně v Čechách jako lidí, kteří dokážou utkat podle dobového obrazu přehozy přes královské postele, nebo vyrobit svícny, nebo vyrobit zbraně, vyrobit prostě cokoliv kovového, co si režisér jenom vymyslí. A v Čechách jsme na to specializovaní. Každý americký režisér, se kterým jsem mluvila, říkala, říkal, to je neuvěřitelný, já Čechovi řeknu nějaký svůj úplně sen největší a už rovnou si u toho říkám, jaký budu muset jako realizovat kompromisy, a ten Čech mi nabídne šest variant, z toho pět je lepší než ta moje. My jsme v tom opravdu skvělí jako Česká republika. Navíc máme výhodu, že nikdy neřekneme, to nejde. Naši kreativci nikdy neříkal, to nejde. Neříkají to, prostě odcházejí do dílny a vracejí se s tím, že mají několik variant. A té akce, když se to potom předvádí tomu režisérovi, se říká show and tell a je to velká zábava. Nic jsme tady dle vidíte, že do roku 2009, od toho roku 2006, co jsem nastoupila na ministerstvo kultury, jsem se potýkala s tím, jak vysvětlit, co to ty filmové pobídky jsou, proč by mít měli, jaký mají přínosy a tak dále. V roce 2010 se zavedly. V roce 2010, 11, 12 jsme se tak trošku jako potáceli v delíriu a snažili se to nějak jakoby zefektivnit. A teprve v roce 2013 vznikl současný nový státní fond kinematografie, který poskytuje jak filmové pobídky, tak podporu národní kinematografie. A pak už vidíte, jak to jde krásně nahoru. A letos se nám dokonce povedlo, že jsme částku na filmové pobídky, která nám vždycky stačila, což bylo 800 milionů korun, vyčerpali v půlce roku. Pak nám vláda, děkuji úctivě, jestli tady někdo sedí, přidala další půl miliardy a letos budeme na přílivu zahraničních investic ve výši 9 miliard. Já chápu, že to je možná málo, ale pro Českou republiku je to hodně. To se nám ještě nepovedlo. Tak, a nyní kudy na to. Máme tady jazyk administrativního kmene. Vy, kreativci, se musíte domluvit nejenom s politikama, ale zároveň s těma úředníkama, který takzvanou politickou vůli musí realizovat. 
což je dost těžký. Asi takhle. Když s nima budete hovořit, tak to bude komplikovaný. Snažte se je pochopit. Oni mají svou pravdu a vědějí, co dělají. Jenom máte prostě jako, jak bych to tak řekla, jiný způsoby komunikace. Musíte se jako naladit na stejnou rovinu, nepište texty, o tady je kousek dál, respektive oni mají ty definice. Máme definice české, máme definice bruselské, máme pozitivní příklady, víme, že to venku je, ale u nás to furt tak nějak jako vázne. Je super, že máme to memorandum, fakt jsem šťastná. Nicméně, tadyhle je přesně to, co máte dělat. Nepište texty. Státní zpráva má strašně moc textů, dlouhých, bez odstavců, mnoho a mnoho stran. Malujte obrázky. Jste kreativci, takže tím obrázkem toho dokážete říct daleko víc než tím textem. A nebo točte videa. A teďka nevím, jak ho mám zapnout. Um, Tímhletím videem jsme dokázali v jeden moment um, poslanecké sněmovně vysvětlit, co to teda ten film je, kolik to zaměstnává lidí, že opravdu ty lidi pracují a to od pěti od rána a že to opravdu má nějakou předanou hodnotu. Nicméně stále jsme se nedostali ještě k tomu, aby jsme vlastně měli trvale udržitelný systém financování těch pobídek, takže pokaždé, když se v audiovizi nebo v filmovém nebo audiovizuálním průmyslu stane nějaký zvrat, jako například teďka máme záplavu toho, že platformy začaly vyrábět svůj vlastní obsah, když to předtím to jenom skupovali od někoho jiného, takže se vlastně z mnoho násobila výroba všech výrob a tak dále. Druhá věc je, že když se blíží takzvaně ekonomická recese, tak lidi přestanou kupovat dovolený, přestanou kupovat auta, zaplatí si Netflix a usadí se u televize. Takže samozřejmě platformy vědějí, že blížily se krize, hurá, musíme natočit ohromné množství obsahu, aby bylo na co se koukat. Takže ten audiovizuální průmysl jde trošičku jako jinudy než ten automobilový průmysl. A proto by bylo vhodné toho, co využít. No. Takže respektive neustále je nám říkáno, že musíme mít různé propočty. Propočítat jde prakticky cokoliv. Držím se jedné věty Václava Klauze a ta zní, nevěřím žádnému grafu, který jsem si sám nepadělal. Vždycky po vás budou chtít, abyste to vypočítali, ale vždycky to je blbost. Prostě jako to jsou prostě, jak chcete spočítat kvalitu, kvantity, prostě e, nicméně je dobrý nějaký vzorec mít a předstírat, že funguje. E, pak máme něco, co se jmenuje NACE. To je velká záhada. <laughs> Úřednictvo, které musí mít všechno v kolonkách, si vyrobilo kolonky na e, takový nějaký jako odvětví ekonomiky. Každého z nás se snaží narvat do jedné té kolunky, ale ty kreativní věci mu jim tak trošku jakoby vypadávají přes okraj a nehodějí se vůbec do žádných nebo do několika na jednou a tak dále. Takže v momentě, kdy já mám návrh rozpočtu a příjemcem filmové pobídky se stává nejs 59 a ministerstvo financí, respektive úřednictvo ministerstva financí hledá příjmy fyzických a právnických osob opět na 59, tak tam se těch příjmů nedočká, protože filmový průmysl je od nejs jedna až do nejs 100. Takže vlastně jakoby máte truhláře, ale ten není 59 producent. To je prostě truhlář, který je někde od 1 do 99, respektive 100. A to je jedno, jestli to je truhlář nebo zahradník, který musí vysadit 500 tují před dekoraci, nebo prostě kdokoliv jiný. Takže filmový průmysl, stejně jako ostatní průmysly, se podle nejs počítají velmi komplikovaně. Nicméně prostě si vyrobíme kolečko, tam dáme nějaký barvy, a ono z toho něco vypadne. To se naučte dělat, to je důležitý. Nicméně, tadyhle tohle je vlastně v uvozovkách taková jakoby, e, mapa toho, odkud k nám jezdí točit. E, podle toho, odkud k nám jezdí točit, podle toho se samozřejmě pohybují i ty výrobní rozpočty. A říkám e, svým způsobem letos, která se nám podařilo, pravděpodobně to ještě musíme dopočítat, 9 miliard, což je jako velký úspěch, což jsme ještě doteďka jakoby neměli. A to ani před zavedením filmových pobídek, jako obecně ve světě. E, tadyhle jsme se snažili tímto obrázkem, autor je Jája, 
<laughs> jsme se snažili vysvětlit, um, jakým způsobem vlastně funguje ten filmový štáb a jeho dodavatele. Protože vlastně vždycky my všichni házeli zpátky, no tak prostě to je podpora jednoho odvětví. No není. Tady máte strom a to je jeden film. Ty zelený obrázky, ty zelený kostičky, to jsou filmové profese. A každá ta filmová profese má svoje vlastní červený jablíčka, což jsou jejich dodavatelé. A to je 60% výrobního rozpočtu filmu. Takže vlastně... To není podpora jednoho odvětví. Audiovize zaměstnává mnoho a mnoho dalších odvětví, většinou kreativních. Tak, tady dnes vlastně máme k jednomu filmu Nightfall. Ten, jak jsem řekla, je průřezový. Já si myslím, že většina kreativních průmyslů jsou průřezový. Základem je, že to vlastně není továrna, která by byla jednoduše spočitatelná. Máte tam prostě tři pásy, ty jedou prostě denní směna, noční směna, u toho se střídá nějaký určitý počet dělníků, který odevzdávají sociální, zdravotní a daně. Takhle moc filmový průmysl vlastně spočítat nejde. Producent staví tu továrnu s každým novým filmem úplně komplet celou novou. Takže vlastně největší sranda je, že vlastně na, ten, na tu továrnu potřebujete nějaký místo, nějakou příjezdovou cestu, něco se tam staví, vznikne tam hala. Ten filmový průmysl se prostě pohybuje takzvaně v našem případě po celé České republice, nikde nic nezanechá, maximálně, když natáčí na nějaké památce, tak tam něco opraví. A je to přímý příjem do veřejných rozpočtů. Dodavatelé jsou malé a střední filmy, většinou rodinné. Tadyhle jsme takhle krásně vzali Nightfall ložnici, kde je vidět, kolik malých a středních podniků a podnikatelů vlastně celý ten, celou tu dekoraci vyrábělo. Když se podíváte, tak tam vlastně jako není žádný filmař. To jsou všecko e, různé prostě firmy, které vyrábějí primárně jako pro někoho jiného, nebo na velikonoční a vánoční trhy pletou dečky. Takže když dostanou tadyhle zakázku od e, Netflixu na výrobu něčeho, tak jsou vlastně strašně šťastní. Takže v momentě, kdyby takzvaně jako přestanou filmové pobídky a přestanou sem jezdit filmaři z celého světa, tak jasně, 40% filmového průmyslu neboli osvětlovači, gripáci, kamera, ty se posunou do nějakého jiného státu, kde budou poskytovat své služby, ale 60% malých a středních podnikatelů, který pracují tímto kreativním způsobem, nebude mít zakázky od těchto těch vlastně filmových profesí. Tadyhle ještě, tadyhle máme nějaké hradby, furt to samý. No a tady máme PR. Vlastně e, přijel Spider-Man, vyklidil Karlův most, což bylo dost těžký, prošel se po něm a je krásný, když sedíte v tom kině, sedíte ne na premiéře, ale v normálním kině s normálníma lidma a teďka tam ty lidi říkají, je, hele, to je u nás. To je krásný pocit. A je to reklama úplně zadarmo, protože toho Spider-Mana fakt viděl celý svět. A ještě je super, jak tam ten Spider-Man loví v tom telefonu, deset romantických míst Prahy. Nemuselo se dělat výběrové řízení podle zákona o zadávání veřejných zakázek, řešit kvalitativní a kvantitativní parametry. Prostě přijel Spider-Man a nechal tady za 15 dní 159 milionů. Super, ne? Tak. Podpora montoven a těžkého průmyslu je jednoznačná, lze definovat hospodárnost, efektivitu a účelnost. Kreativní průmysly jsou založeny na talentu, ten se naučit nedá a změřit taky ne. Kontrolní orgány mě při kontrole státního fondu kinematografie vyžadovaly, aby naše koncepce dlouhodobá i krátkodobá byla měřitelná. Přemýšlela jsem, co bych změřila. Výšku a šířku hřebejka, dosažitelnost Oscara a když ho nedosáhne, tak pojďme Frančák, nevím. Prostě u té kreativity, ten, ten, to úřednictvo, ten stát musí postupovat trošku jinak. Bohužel zatím nevíme jak. Nicméně je třeba přijmout fakt, že složitá měřitelnost kreativních průmyslů je nediskvalifikuje, je jen nutné se zaměřit na něco jiného. Tak, hospodárně, efektivně, účelně natočený film si nedovedu představit. Je hospodárný, že má popelka korunku i na hrdelník? Nebo by měla mít jenom korunku? 
Otázka číslo dvě. Může mít čtyř přeží, anebo jeden kůň je hospodárnější? Hospodárnější to je, ale není to efektivní. U kreativních průmyslů hold musí být ta efektivita, jinak to je o ničem, že? Takže tohle je základní problém, který se musíme naučit řešit taky. No. Likvidační komise musí zasednout. <laughs> tak. Slova talent, kreativita, duševní vlastnictví byla doposud spojována se slovy dotace, výdaj, náklad. Chybí slova příjem, výnos, zaměstnanost, práce s přidanou hodnotou. Nepište texty, nepoužívejte cizí slova, mluvte lidskou řečí. Poskarů není nikdy dost. Teď jsme dostali před půl rokem studentského Oscara. Co víc? Děkuji. Ještě jednou děkujeme paní Helena Vezděk Franková ze státního fondu kinematografie. And now uh, the final presentation. Uh, so we've heard a lot of inspirational stories, experiences, experiences and suggestions today. Uh, the final presentation comes from uh, a state that is similar to Czech Republic uh, in size, and that is also <laughs> our neighbor state. And what the more, uh, the city of Linz, which will be discussed too, belongs uh, alongside with Prague and Brno to the network uh, of 180 UNESCO creative cities. This net network was designed to connect cities uh, that hold creativity as a strategic fa factor of their sustainable development. So we are going to hear about variety of supporting programs uh, that Austria and Upper Austria offers uh, to the local creatives, as well about the stories of success. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome George Chemetsberger. <laughs> from Creative Region, Linz and Upper Austria. Welcome. Okay. Hi. So, thank you very much for having me. So, uh, I guess if you look at the first slide, uh, please raise your hands if you know this guy on the slide. I as almost 100% know this guy. Uh, who of you have seen the last movie? I guess it's called The Dark Fate drops dramatically okay <laughs> so maybe uh, he's not that famous anymore uh, <laughs> but what you can see that Austria isn't really famous for creativity and innovation uh, it's more famous for Arnold Schwarzenegger once a guy told me he's among the five still alive famous people all over the world and uh, we took this picture at South by Southwest, so it's kind of selfie. And it took us more than two hours to get into his talk, so it shows us somehow the guy was right. So he's really, really famous, uh, but not for creativity and innovation, maybe more for sustainability right now. Um, so Austria is more famous for Schwarzenegger schnitzel, or because today's Champions League Tuesday and for the football geeks, you know, David Alaba, maybe. So, maybe the things can change and should change. Um, so we're also doing a lot of EU-funded projects and you know what this means. So you're traveling a lot, meeting a lot of people, uh, talking and exchanging. And what we always hear that is uh, we in Austria are having a really good system to support young creatives. And this is also the topic of my talk. It's a creative guide to a more innovative uh, ecosystem. As you told us before, uh, there are a lot of skills declining and there is one special skill uh, really, really uh, increasing and it's about creativity and you can see it um, in the World Economic Forum that the first three skills are analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies. If you're familiar with all these startup uh, 
speech, it would be some kind of agility. Uh, and of course, creativity, originality, and initiative. So, um, and Austria has about, uh, every, every state in Austria has an own organization uh, supporting the creative industries. We are doing all the groundwork uh, for the creative economic system. And uh, a couple of days back, I uh, had a meeting with an innovation manager and he told me a really nice and easy metaphor. Um, it's like if you have the best seeds, at you saw it on the dry soil, nothing is going to happen. So you have to have the best uh, soil that the seeds and the plants can grow. And um, I'm always asked, okay, what, George, what are you doing? And sometimes I can compare my work to the work for a gardener. As a gardener, so we are uh, maintaining, we are fostering the ecosystem. And you can compare it with the plant. A plant also needs resources. So it re needs water. <clears throat> it needs uh, sun, depending on the plant. Um, it needs care. And the same applies to the creatives. They also need some kind of resources. Much about funding. They need somebody to take care of them, to be the coach, to be uh, their feedback buddy. And uh, also they need sometimes to, uh, to be in the spotlight, to be carried out. Uh, before the curtain. And uh, this is one of my favorite so-called plants. And I'm not speaking about the right one, the aloe vera-like plant in my uh, bedroom. And I'm not also talking about apple. I'm talking about the guys Fratello. Uh, they founded a company about four or five years ago. And what they invented is the guitar teacher in your pocket. And it took them a couple of years, but they ended up at the Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this kind of conference. So it's uh, one of the biggest conferences in the world. And they were on stage because they are uh, among three or five different uh, companies which are um, in this kind of Apple special programs and can and you can use one of the new techniques developed by Apple uh, while using the app Fratello and why I'm showing Fratello is because um, they almost got any support we offer in Austria or Upper Austria they got funding from 5,000K to 200K, showed up in TV shows like the Austrian version of Shark Tank. They're collaborating with universities, uh, doing the research on AI. They also go to the universities and recruiting all the uh, stuff they need. And as well as, they always pop up at our space to ask for help, to, for coaching, or if we know some special programs to boost their business. And they're also uh, having their office in a kind of co-working space. So it's not just about the space and the cheap place, it's about the environment they get from there. So, so just drop one ad. So if you wanna learn how to play guitar, check out fratello.com. Um, and as we heard today a lot of times, uh, after almost 10 years supporting and coaching young creatives, I guess one of the first questions is always about money. It's always about how to get funded. I need some money to get my project run. And in Austria we are quite lucky because we have a really, really good uh, funding system. Maybe not if you compare it with the big funds investing Series A money, but uh, if you scale it down, we have a lot of um, different funds to get your project uh, started. And um, I divided it for very easy reasons in three parts. 
So it's small, medium, and large. And the small one is always about 5,000 euros. And, and you don't have to do a lot. It's really, really, really easy going. Sometimes it's just the price. Uh, sometimes it's, or, yeah, uh, award for your idea. It's really easy going. A couple of years back, we had this uh, called Creative Industry Check, funded by the European Union. And the aim of this uh, check was you, you have a project and it have to, has to be done by the creatives. And the aim was um, that the corporates, the other branches, see which kind of positive effects, values, you can get when they collaborate with the creatives. And unfortunately, we don't have this creative check anymore. But what we have right now is uh, some kind of a development. We are having a 200,000 funding call uh, works from the, with the same kind of uh, principle. It's, it, it funds uh, creative collaborations up to 200,000 uh, euros. And what we also have is, uh, because everybody knows who's doing projects, 5,000 years is almost nothing. So it's like one month developer, or if you go south-south, it's maybe two months a developer, but you can't do really, really much. So what we have is um, the medium-sized fundings from Austrian business agencies up to 50,000 Ks. And we have it um, every quarter you can apply for this call and you get up to 50,000 uh, euros to finalize your prototype. And of course, the next step is you have to go to the market because if you have the best prototype, it doesn't mean anything. If you can't find somebody, um, you can sell this kind of uh, project, product. And then we have the next step is, in, we call it Impulse XL and XL stands for uh, these 200,000 euros you can get. And um, compared to other fundings, also across Europe, there are some special specialities, like it's non-refundable. So your risk as a creative is a minimum. You don't have to pay it back. Uh, and depending on the call, it's up to 90% funded. So if you do, Imagine there's this uh, creative solution call, which was in uh, development of the creative uh, industries check. You get 200,000 euros and 90% is funded. And then you can really make progress with your project because you don't have to worry about your own equity, your partners or your uh, bank and everything. And uh, Another good thing is it's not only funding investments. You can fund uh, marketing activities, you can fund uh, services you buy from other creatives. So it's completely free uh, what you are doing. And uh, also compared to other systems, Austria or um, these Austrian uh, business services they are not taking equity from you and from your project. As well as, um, depending on the, uh, on the call and on the funding volume, you don't even have, have to have an established company. So it's really, if you uh, have your idea and just think, okay, how to get started, you don't have to uh, establish a company first and then apply for the call. So you can apply for the call and if you get funded, you can establish the company right afterwards. And um, in Austria, we are having a lot of different business supporting agencies which are supplying these kinds of grants. For example, Vienna is really, really doing a great job right now because they are also opening their calls for creatives outside of Austria to come to Vienna, to settle down in Vienna. Um, And another big issue is education. So just uh, drop 
a few words what happened in the last couple of years in Linz. Linz has about 200,000 inhabitants. And in the last five years, um, we had three universities completely uh, refurbished. Re so it's like mm, the city of Linz, the uh, government of Upper Austria committed and invested a lot to be more competitive, uh, to provide the talents, the ones from your uh, quote is like, the students, we don't have the jobs right now, uh, to really have a good innovative um, atmosphere. For example, uh, we established a machine learning institute, I found it by Sepp Hochreiter, and if you Google Sepp Hochreiter, you will quickly come uh, to the articles why he has a major impact on Hey Google and Apple Siri and all these uh, voice things. We are having the first uh, European professorship for robopsychology. They are researching how we are communicating, interacting with robots. And we are having, you can see these guys uh, on the picture now, a study called Fashion and Technology because uh, fashion is a really, really big issue also regarding sustainability. And uh, these guys at the Fashion and Technology Institute are researching how fashion can be designed and produced uh, in the future using new technologies. But, um, but all, what you also have to have uh, for your ecosystem is the space. The young creatives have to be somewhere. They need a space to grow, they need a space to act, they need a space to collaborate. And uh, when I ask you the question, what do Amazon, Google, and Hewell Packard have all in common? Apple as well. They were funded in a garage. So we don't have so many businesses in garages, but what we have is uh, a lot of abandoned old factory sites, which are now transferred to creative and innovative spaces. And um, our office is situated in the Backfabrik Linz. I don't know if anybody of you has ever been to Linz, uh, but it's about 80,000 square meters factory site. And uh, the city of Linz bought it about 10 years ago for about 40 million euros. And let's say the city of Linz doesn't have so much cash. So it was really a decision sticking to the creative industries are going to sell it to some kind of investor and make a huge profit. But they committed to the creative industries and they developed the site uh, step by step. When the last cigarette was rolled, in the tobacco fabric there has been around 300 workers. And now, almost 10 years later, we are having 1,800 workers on the side and 200 companies. So, and uh, what's special about this place is it's not only for creatives. So it's, um, the, I guess, uh, all these, the best thing on the tobacco fabric tobacco factory is the diversity. So you have to pick corporates because the corporates are dealing with the fact that they're somewhere in the outskirts and the creative people, the curious minds, they stay in the city. They like the urban, they like the art and culture. They don't want to move in a place with 4,000 inhabitants where there is almost nothing. And what they do is um, they set up branches within the tobacco fabric because uh, then uh, their creatives, their curious minds can work in the factory. And that's a real, real boost because for the creatives, they are just one minute away from potential customers, from potential uh, partners. And for us, I have to say, one of the best places to be in the Parkfabrik is the small Thai stand where you get your uh, lunch or the coffee place, the public coffee place, because then you randomly bunch into people and then you start just talking. 
and then you really uh, can expand your network, you get to know each other. That's the strength of the tobacco fabric. But what you need is you need someone who takes care of it. For example, at the Bugfabric, Fabric, there are 1,800 people working somehow in the creative industries. In Upper Austria, we are having 5,000 organizations, enterprises working in the creative industries. It's almost 10% of the whole economy, of the whole enterprise is working in the creative industries. So it's a kind of no brainer to establish a company, a business supporting agency specialized in supporting the creatives. Because what we experienced in our almost eight years of working with the creatives, uh, because we are also a creatives. One of my colleagues worked uh, in a startup, the other one in a big fashion company and big media companies. Uh, one has been a solo entrepreneur and marketing consultant. So we know the pain. We also look like creative. So we are one of them. So we know the pains. And um, we are really, really easy to approach. And that's the feedback we got. Is if you are from the field, it's uh, super easy. And they really like what we are doing. And uh, we had a workshop a couple of days back regarding our vision. And it was uh, mentioned today a lot of times that Creativity is on the rise, and our vision is now the creatives will be the new developers. In a couple of years, and when you get imagine, uh, remind the slide from the World Economic Forum, where creativity is one of the most important skills in the future, it was 2020, no, 22, so in two years. So it's not the future, it's, it's tomorrow. So... Uh, what we do is uh, we focus how to train creativity. We offer training programs, uh, design thinking, service design, creative problems, solution. And uh, what we try to do is uh, giving the creatives and the corporates the skills they need to tackle the future uh, challenges. And um, what works really, really well is um, the design thinking and service design workshops. And we have a program called Innovation Agent Academy. And the aim is uh, getting the people the skills uh, to manage the change with design thinking, with service design. And one of our rules is uh, there have to be 50% creatives within this class. Because if you uh, look at other design thinking classes, it's always... Uh, a bunch of managers sitting in their suits there and looking for some creative input. Uh, but our USB is we have a 50% rule. And we also try to uh, engage more women in our workshop because uh, we always see that uh, depending on the topic, it's hard to get also a 50% quote. And some kind of uh, nice side effect is um, these workshops are not this one weekend of design thinking uh, injection. It's a really intense class. So corporates and creatives are working about 15 days, 20 days together next to each other. They corporates see what creatives are really doing. They're not just here for designing a new, better looking class. With their skills, they can tackle the challenges out there. And within the, these workshops, they see what are they really doing, and they are bonding, and they see the value what creatives are doing. And um, to be honest, it's also some kind of cash cow for us, because uh, the corporates, they don't mind if one workshop is about 7,000 euros, and so we can somehow fund uh, programs for younger entrepreneurs uh, where we know they are not able to pay, I don't know, 250 euros for a one day workshop. Uh, another thing we believe is that creativity is the resource for new services, uh, products, and things. 
we see uh, almost daily on which program projects creatives are working. And um, you see, this is LumaPod, the la first and fastest tripod. Tripod is a uh, yeah for a camera maybe. Yeah, there are two tripods, um, and it all happened. Uh, the, the, um, the project was started at the university. So they did one year's research in the, on the university and then they started believing, hey, we did a really, really good job here. Let's make business out of them. And that's what that was the point we stepped in. We helped them to set up a company. We helped them to set up a um, Kickstarter campaign, a crowdfunding campaign to get their project funded. And that's what uh, we want to do next year. We are acting like a project scout. We are going directly to new universities, uh, talking with the professors. Who are the curious ones, the ones who are working on the project? And then uh, contact them and say, hey, uh, what's up? Do you want to start a business? And then we provide them with the, with the skills they need. Depends if they need funding or coaching, whatever. We just try uh, to get more projects like this. Yeah. And also funding is a big, big issue in Austria. So we have funding boot camps. So it's like uh, two days, like a hackathon, like a funding hackathon. We are having uh, two days, the interesting projects, the persons, and the experts regarding business plan, marketing, funding, IPR, and everything sitting together, working um, 48 hours, three days, just to finish the application to be more successful. Because we in Asia, we're lucky. We're having a lot of different uh, funding. But the thing is, uh, the budget is limited. So we have to do everything that our applications are uh, more and more, more successful when they're applying. And um, the resources for new ones is also, we are uh, working since one year with 10 partners uh, on the topic of fashion and technology and how we are going to produce a design uh, fashion in the future. And we're also having a Horizon 2020 uh, funding. And actually, actually there are seven uh, artists doing the research on how we can design and produce fashion in the future. So uh, we are not only getting the creatives the money, we are also getting the region money. We're getting uh, new topics in the region because we in Austria, Upper Austria, we are having all the corporates who can produce uh, the fashion. We are having uh, the creatives who can design the fashion. So maybe uh, when you talk in the future about fashion, and fashion design, you don't say Paris, Milano, or New York, so maybe you can, or when you think about fashion manufacturer, you don't say Bangladesh, Thai, Vietnam, or uh, Turkey. Maybe you can say Upper Austria, or fill in another region. You know? And when we stick to the fashion thing, um, uh, last week I had been to Slush Festival. I don't know if you guys know the Slush Festival. It's in Helsinki and it's one of the biggest tech festival, tech and startup festival. And Etienne Ko, she's the co-founder of uh, Show My Size, uh, was on stage and presenting her project. And just within one slide, she tackled why she's doing it, how she's doing it, what she's doing. And she showed it by showing a simple Google Maps screenshot from Linz to Helsinki, about 1,800 kilometers or something like that. And the reason why she showed it, it was because uh, all the uh, clothing returns from online shopping, Zalando and Co. put together in, the, in trucks and lined up would be till Helsinki. And we are just talking about the returns in Austria this year. So then you can really th see which kind of problems creatives are tackling, which kind of solutions they are offering, which kind of value they are adding. And because this is a major 
problem that uh, the value of creativity, the people outside of the bubble don't really see, okay, what are you guys really doing? So and um, that's the thing what we do. We're doing a lot of awareness campaigns. We're doing uh, vlogs, blogs, podcasts, open houses. Um, well, we are going to events from other branches and say, hey, uh, can we contribute? Can we organize a panel? Because we are going outside of our bubble and talking about what creatives are really, really doing. And here you finally see Etienne Co at the stage uh, of the Sloth Festival. And this is also what we really interested in because uh, through digitalization, there is no border. Like for a couple of years back, you do your business in 20 kilometers. Now you can do your business everywhere in the world. And what we have to do is offer the creative ways to go to the spotlight, to go on international fairs, festival events and everything. And what we do is uh, we have a simple, simple program and we just reduce any pain they have. There is no excuse anymore. We offer them housing, we offer them tickets, we offer them one-to-one -one coaching. Um, to be really, really best prepared because if you go to a festival and this festival is about five days or ten or so and you need two days just to get comfortable with the festival, you have lost almost half the time. So it's really important to have to be really, really good prepared. And what we do is um, we also scout the right kind of festival. So it's not about only about networking or uh, inspiration. It's really about business, what can they achieve? Uh, I showed you um, the third slide was the Apple slide with Fratello. It took them three years of work to be on stage with Tim Apple. And um, you can trace it back to the first appearance at the South by Southwest Festival, where they get in contact with Sony Music and they got a deal one year after. They got in contact with Apple, Apple developers and got a deal afterwards. So it's uh, for us really, really important to show them the spotlight out of our region, out of Upper Austria. And because uh, we are public funded and it's always a thing, uh, yeah, if the politicians can see the value what we are doing it's always important to show them the value because sometimes I have the feeling that they just understand pure figures. And for every euro we get from our, um, um, from, from city of Linz and Upper Austria, we get three euros back. But in this calculations, it's just, you know, super, super easy. It's the one we, we get by funding projects from the EU, by consulting um, the creatives that they get money. In this kind of calculation, we haven't added the kind of value you get as a creative when you are on stage with, on the Apple conference and getting all the press coverage. So basically it's, super easy what we are doing. We are not doing any rocket science. We're just, yeah, doing our stuff with passion, talking to the creatives. And yeah, if you have any questions regarding our projects, our approach, yeah. So I'm happy to help you in this case. So keep on creating. Thank you so much, uh, Georg Tremetzberger. Thank you so much also for your attention because this was the final presentation and now it's your turn because it's time for networking. So thank you much for your uh, attention and I have one surprise for you because Christmas is coming so the first gift will be uh, in your emails. Soon you will get uh, as well as uh, the results of the Creatino project, also uh, all the presentation from uh, our speakers today, so you can consider it as a first gift. 
uh, of this year. And yes, it's, it's your time now, so you can meet each other and have a creative afternoon. Thank you so much. Dámy a pánové, ještě jednou děkuji za pozornost. Jestli už jste rozuměli, jak jsem říkala, dostanete e-mailem jak výsledky celého projektu Creatino, tak všechny dnešní prezentace jako dárek a nám na oplátku prosím tady nechte ty sluchátka, pokud jste je používali. Mějte se krásně, je čas na networking, užijte si zbytek odpoledne.